I have to carry $5 million malpractice insurance if it is. So you have to also understand that there are forces in the place that are, has nothing to do with medicine. I cannot afford to start talking about biotensegrity in my practice because I will lose my license. Because people will say, Dr. Talek, show me the study where you prove your concept and, and then we will talk. And that's the also the problem where we face, I'll give you an example. I do quite a bit of regenerative procedures where there are studies from 1950s that we can, let's say, seal the cracked disc and avoid surgery. But right now you have no idea how much pressure it is from medical industry if I as a surgeon will stop operating. So I am just saying that there is more underneath that the patient or even the person who is not standing on top of the patient with a knife doing. We just have to do something because there is a problem. And I cannot as a surgeon afford to say, well, I'm not sure whether this is this mechanics or that mechanics because the mother is expecting that I know everything. I am forced every day to position of the God and I only know that I know only half of it, how it works. And I pray that it will end up good. That's Thank the you. ugly truth. That's so, really, uh, that's a great perspective. Let me yeah. just throw throw a couple of okay, things but, there, but right? Leonid, I, I want to get Steve's response too, if we can. Oh, yes, yes, sure, sure. I am sorry, I don't want to uh, kidnap this. No, no, you're, you're, you're bringing up wonderful points. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's really good. Yeah, well, I will say in the latter part of my career, I gave up surgery for that very reason. Yes. I found, you know, the external pressures were great to do, to do something and cut. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I became a non-operating orthopedic surgeon because I was pursuing another field. But there's a difference between social pressures and, and, and science. And what we're trying to do is put the science behind it. So that when you say, well, there's no pressure proof that it's a tensegrity, yeah, I will also say there's no proof that the spine is a column. But somehow or other, you that's the basis you're doing surgery. So if I there's 100 no, agree. I right, 100 but, but, agree. But, but, but you do the surgery based on that concept. Yes. So to me, that you know, that was a problem for me to do that. When I was I was doing spine surgery, and that that's I how I got it. You know, I said I can't do it anymore because I'm doing things that I don't feel I, I'm not comfortable with with anymore. Because clearly, I was doing things that made no mechanical sense to me. <clears throat> I am 100% agree, Dr. Levin, and I am not saying. I am just saying that, like for example. But give you example. I started doing maybe six years ago. We started doing endoscopic procedures. Now, for those who are not surgeons, just to make it simple, every surgery has two parts: to get to the problem and then to fix the problem. And in a spine, we have actually only two problems: we either unpinch the nerve, or we try to stabilize structure that is broken, whether it's a bone or this and that. But where we differ is how to get to that problem. So some surgeons will make a big cut. We use smaller cut with microscope. Now we have a endoscope, which is the camera. We operate through the keyhole. And I, we, there are different things. And these days we can even avoid surgery. And we are now understanding more of fascia and, and collateral trauma that we as a physicians, we do. But we are very, very slow to evolve. What I'm saying is that I am 100% with it that we can discuss biotensegrity and like I can go for hours probably to, to address some of the things that are not in or doesn't make sense biomechanically, even me. But there is also humongous body of people, American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons and, and uh, spine surgery, they make the consensus and they say, this is what we consider as a standard of care. It may not make sense 
for example, fusion might not make a sense, but then you as a practicing surgeon has to face the, this answer. Either you will go against what is the perceived as a knowledge, and then you basically will not practice. You will not be practicing and you can make this decision, but not everybody is able to, or they will, it's not an easy decision, what I'm saying. And that's exactly the, second, the point. And a second, see, that's what that's with Steve. That was happened, right? So you yes, see, that's exactly. what, what fascinated me. I understand. So that he actually made this decision that, you know, well, you know, that was a quote, and we will hear it in, in one of his future episodes where he said, well, probably as a surgeon, I would have been like four to 10 times, you know, five to 10 times uh, wealthier than I was as a manual practitioner, but I slept better. So basically, I understand. That was it. But I'll give you another example. Oncology, we use chemotherapy, which is a mutagen to treat genetic disease cancer. So we have, you have to understand that medicine is the example of, we do stuff by observation, not knowing what's going on. Like for example, 2000 years ago, uh, we were putting on a battle wound, a steak and a little bit of aluminum powder. We didn't know at that time, we meaning doctors that 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 aluminum powder has actually antibiotic or bactericidal effects. And then even at that time, the little literature says, the doctor says, if that doesn't work, work make the pr or say prayer. In other words, we are forced as a doctor every day to do something that we do not know what's going on. We many, many, many times, we don't know how to treat or how it is happening that you have hypertension. We just observe that if you take this, and many of our observations are by accident. We were trying to figure out the drug for helping heart and find out that man has the incidental erection and Viagra was uh, discovered. For example, we have find out many, many others. Let's say we were figuring out that orthopedists would put bone marrow on a bone and it would promote healing. And Dr. Kaplan will identify in 1980s in case Western so-called stem cell. And it took 30 years to find out that those cells are not really stem cells. And what he was able to do in a lab is only in vitro, not in vivo. What I am trying to say that I would not make these simply simple comments that, oh yes, I there are probably, I would say majority of medical care, the ugly truth is the doctor don't know, but trying through trial and error. Okay, that's, that's a very good, that's a very good perspective, you know, in a way that it's really on the one hand, it keeps the hope that things are not exactly commoditized, despite all the pressures that you are describing, right? So you see, you kind of really went into a very important point that there is a consensus and the consensus has the legal consequences and you as a practitioner you are facing this dilemma you know if you want to practice you have to abide by consensus and you only have you know fixed breathing room to to you know to sort of have a freedom there and that's but one of the things that actually i want to bring there is that since we you know, speaking of their paradigm shifts in that ones or discussion of the new approaches, I still also want to just say is that, you know, as a surgeon, you are being put in the, on a burning plate on a single, every single date, you know, you have to deliver things right now, right? So it's your window, your time budget for changing things is very, very short. So, and uh, historically that kind of made the surgeon the most uh, important person. And that's why one of your standard questions is, right? What, you know, what, if you break a bone, who would you want to have it set? I would say, yes, of course, I would want to go to Dr. Tarek, you know, and say into Houston, you know, and get it set by you. But uh, the thing is, so, but the thing is that what we are also looking at, right? So you see, and what we are trying to bring as an important point is that, the other profession, right? So you see the slow profession, the profession which works with the kind of non, 
uh, immediately damage things, right? So you see like talking about the body work in general and so on, where there is a luxury of the extra time, the luxury of being slow, the luxury of looking at the processes which might take longer time to bake, right? So you see, this is one of those things which, you know, I believe comes as a very important conversation because historically, you know, due to the legal circumstances and due to like kind of to the reputation, the surgeon and everything that comes from the orthopedics and so on, you know, like being sits at the top of the food chain when it comes to anything that, uh, you know, gets to do with the movement analysis and the movement practice. But in fact, what we are seeing today, right, is that again, we have the luxury of people living longer. We have the luxury of people kind of asking for care and help when they can afford and kind of willing to do say much longer time budgets and by longer time budgets i mean like 50 hours 100 hours 500 hours right so and that in that sense the change of time budget and the change of the increments of what we do also the thing which requires a certain re-understanding and kind of complete overhaul of the theoretical basis in other words what i'm saying is that you know if we all it's a it's an important conversation where do we start from do we start from by the slow processes or do we start from the point where we are already in the emergency situation so which also changes a lot the type of science that you would use for this purpose i am 100 percent agreeing and i would like to make two comments only number one time is a precious commodity and if i may i will share something you, you mentioned a little bit henry ford and I do practice today in 2022. So just a little bit of uh, the numbers. I see 6,000 patients a year. I see 72 patients every clinic every other day. I see nine patients every hour. I have three rooms running. And I know by heart that I have five minutes for every patient because hospital require me to move the what they call move the product through the time through the assembly line so my clinic looks like this the nurse comes to you and let's say you have backache and you come and start talking like three months you did this that and other and my nurse will attentively listen and then come to get me but outside of the room what nobody see and that's it's a little bit the comment that the surgeon comes and doesn't see a child uh, this this is how does it look like from the other side. So I have a timer on me. I walk in the room. I will push the timer that everybody knows when it goes bing. It's not my text message. It means time is up and I have to be out. So I walk in a room. The nurse told me outside, this is 40-year-old gentleman with sciatica. X-rays are ready. I come and I am trained and forced to address the problem, diagnose, review images, do neurologic exam, and decide what we'll be doing next in four minutes. And as soon as there is one minute, so let's say I look at MRI, there is rupture disc, you have sciatica, I will decide that whether you have surgery or not. And then I would say, nurse, please explain what is it, because I would love to talk to you for two hours. But that means that my hospital administrator will say, doctor, you are not seeing enough patients. You are not making your salary and everybody else, and I will be fired. So that's a reality because we as a doctors, and I am fully taking a uh, responsibility, we have sold our farm. We have give the farm to administrators and they run it like factory. I am on top of the food chain. And then I come to surgery. I will just not complaining. I come at 5 a.m. I have six cases to do. I go from surgery to surgery. My hospital is looking where they can make my time more effective, meaning I only operate. I don't even close the wound. They have hired somebody who is the cheaper to close the wound. It is absolutely factory. And I am looked upon and measured 
if I am able to remove your spinal disc and close you in your neck in 45 minutes, hospital charge for that $300,000. I make hospital 50 million a year. That's a, so you guys do understand that US military budget is $700 million a year. US healthcare budget is 5 trillion. It's 80% more. We are in the United States trained by, we are doing absolutely a assembly line medicine. And now when the money got a little bit shorter, we still have 4,000% markup on everything. See, picture this, that I would tell the patient, you don't need surgery. If I tell 10 patients, you don't need surgery, I will have a visit from administrators saying, doctor, you are not doing surgeries, what's going on? You know, we have instruments, we have all this overhead, we pay nurses. That's what we have lost. That has nothing to do with science. This has everything with mighty dollars. This is United States. In Europe, yes. it's different. In yes. Europe, you have doctors who pay salaries. They don't care whether they operate 200 people or 20. But different that's system. totally different, absolutely uncomparable. Yeah. It has nothing to do with science. I am absolutely agreeing with you, but I am just reacting. And forgive me, I have somewhat stole this uh, lecture. No, I mean, this is very interesting. This is very I interesting you know, because you have the insight, that the doctor, insight perspective. That yeah, but, when the uh, nurse... When the nurse says, or somebody who watch me, I will tell you things that sometimes my even kids would say, oh my God, dad, you do not talk to anybody. Because as soon as I would start talking, somebody would come and say, he doesn't have a time. He needs to make decision. Every 30 seconds, somebody asks me in ER, there comes something, this and that. And I'll tell you why, because I am extremely expensive for, the, for that hospital. And if I am making that much money, I am watched. I also have perks. I will be honest. I come to hospital. I stay, stop my car in front of main door. I step out of the car. They take my car. They wash it, park it. I go and I operate. I am a assembly line, a glorified carpenter that just fix the bone, set the bone, screw the bone to the as perfect as possible. So simple decision, whether I am gonna play with the cast for 20 minutes, or I would put under x-ray two screws and it's perfect, it's no brainer to me. It's can faster we, uh, and yeah. that's it. Can we, um, uh, Steve, you may wanna have a response, but also um, I want you to I know- apologize. Mike, Mike's got his, uh, no, I, Dr. Talek, we really appreciate your contribution. It's wonderful. Um, I want to make sure we we hear from Mike when he's ready. Unless Steve, you wanted to say something first. No, I'll let I'll let it I'll let it arrive with just what it is. I think it was a wonderful. It was uh, a wonderful thing, a wonderful, wonderful thing. But we would be of actually American medicine. If you if you are up to it, we would be happy to do kind of a, a party with you when we will just discuss. Because you see, look, my reality is the opposite. I choose things for myself, and you know, and I have a kid coming. You know, I stay with them, you know, basically I'm scheduled for two and a half hours. And I mean, like if I find something interesting and say, wow, you know, bring the camera in. I want to film this. And then, you know, if everybody knows that I'm always late. So you see, like if it takes three and a half hours, everybody knows, you know, like they just call and say, you know, is he late again? I say, yeah, it, it is. So you are it's just... It just, right. you know, but I have time to play, right? I have time to explore. I have time to kind of, you know, like be fascinated in that sense and, you know, and actually to think. And then, you know, I give them and basically I see them every half year and I maybe see like three, 400 people a year all together, right? So you see, but I spend time. So, and this is, a, this is an absolutely amazing thing what you're talking because, you know, I remember... It was 20 years ago, I read it in, you know, when I was in UK and they kind of, they said that, well, in NHS, we have the uh, X-ray evaluation scheduled being 12 minutes, but in reality, kind of the administration pushes for eight minutes. And because it's not, it's understaffed, it's in reality, it's being six minutes. 
And what you're saying, in fact, it's now it's even faster than that, right? And it's really the thing is that life-changing decisions that are taken, you know, are made within four minutes, right? So that's under their watchful eye of the never sleeping uh, kind of uh, accountant, right? So that's impressive. I would, be happy to, I would be happy to talk to you more. I, I, I feel bad that I have kind of stolen this. I'll be happy to talk to you more about different aspects of it. Now, this, this is, is great. We want this to, is great. We want to, um, uh, you know, we're yeah, I guess, I guess I, I, it's, it's worth it's, it's worth a separate conversation. Let's kind of exactly, move on exactly. a bit further. Yeah. Let's, let's go over to Mike. Okay, well, I kind of just want to jump in the same conversation. I, I have a couple yeah. of uh, follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Talek, uh, just very, very quick, not to get too into it, because I think that everybody who's here has a pretty vested interest in, uh, in, in shifting the structure of the system that depends on that ridiculous hierarchy of, of one person at, uh, so far up at the top treating 9,000 people um, for, for one person. That sounds a little imbalanced. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm super appreciative for you <laughs> sharing this because if you didn't, we would have no idea what's going on on the inside. It is so opaque to a normal human being. Um, so I'm uh, very grateful that you've said this because it's, it's blowing my mind wide open. Um, sort of on- but With respect, I mean, it's, this is really impressive. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that if I would tell you why the system works for people in Europe, you would not understand, but I, I will be happy to that th th this is the 10 millimeters under the surface. Sure, sure. And I, I'm assuming that I, I think there's lots of different levers one could potentially be pulling to affect that system. A lot of it has to do with single payer health care and who is the relationship between uh, you, you can agree or disagree. I, I'm talking about the outside stuff, but yeah. like there are a trillion different solutions to one agreed upon problem, um, which is that healthcare is too expensive and depends on uh, too few people who are being paid too much at the top. Um, so assuming for, for, for entertainment's sake that that is in fact the problem or a problem, um, and actually maybe even unrelated, uh, my question for you would be, at the first sign, uh, if people had a greater sense of bodily awareness, um, if you have, say, oh, I'll pick a random number, 9,000 people um, who, who undergo uh, surgery, um, how many of them, and I know this is a completely unscientific number, but like if you had to guess, how many of those could be prevented, uh, avoid surgery altogether if there was a more hands-on uh, uh, intervention that happened sometime during, uh, I don't know, like when they first noticed uh, a problem that got aggravated. I'm not sure I understand uh, your question. Uh, I have, uh, just to FYI, I see 6,000 patients. I do about 800 surgeries a year. So about 10% of my patients will ever need surgery. Gotcha. But Backache, for example, is the second most common problem after common cold. In Houston, every day, there is 40,000 people hurting with a back. What I see as a major problem is that there are people, they teaching doctors and other personnel that we cannot figure out why it hurts. So many of them don't even try. They will mm -hmm. just say, try physical therapy six weeks, do exercises. You have a backache, no diagnosis. Then some of them improve, some of them don't. Those are shuffled into pain management people. They do epidural three to 13 times. They don't care, they just keep you shooting. They are proceduralists. And when everything fails, it ends up in my office. But unfortunately, I have nobody above me. And that's, I apologize, I'm not trying to be arrogant. But I have to either decide that I can help or not. And from my office, it's only to chronic pain management, basically pain pills. Mm -hmm. So my major challenge is that many times I cannot afford to say, oh, my God, I need three hours. Many times I have to have people, they will 
three two information. So I am, you know, I am in assembly line. That's sure. what doc, uh, Dr. Leonid is saying. That would be my dream that he can play for two hours talking and be intrigued. I would be out of hospital next day because I need, I need to, I need, people depend on me that their paycheck will be paid if I don't see and deliver. They will just sure. simply fire and, them. And my, and my question isn't necessarily about that or about you because I have, because given the, the way that the system is set up, I see exactly why you are in that position and I don't doubt it. What I think that, but like as non-surgeons and, and people who are in various parts of the field, I think we're all interested in affecting uh, different pieces of the thing uh, so that potentially you do have less time than, or more time available than that. Uh, or not even, not. I, I, I guess it's like, what I mean is that it's not my, it's not even about you is what I'm saying or spending the time or surgery. What we could improve that number one, like I've been watching this forum for a year when I had the time because I read everything what the Dr. Levin wrote and I actually have some ideas also, but so I am interested in this. Uh, I agree 100%. We have a lot of things where we do not know. I think that what we need to do, we need to start like us, doctors needs to come and talk and first agree what we are dealing with. I cannot understand that we look at the same problem, backache, and we do disagree how, sh what is it and how we need to approach it. Picture that you would come with your car to a shop and they would not know whether it's a bicycle, airplane or locomotive. And they will do, you would think like these guys are nuts. We need to start talking about basic things, how the body works. And, you know, I, uh, uh, if we stand in front of the problem, like, for example, in Grand Canyon and two of us, we have to first decide whether how to get across, whether we're going to build a bridge or airplane. These are two different things, but we, we are not communicating. Like, I live in my silo. And even I can see, and I forgive me, that I kind of been a little bit triggered by the comment that they don't see a baby. <laughs> Yeah, we are taught not to see patients. We are seeing you need to fix the problem and next. Fix the problem next. If you cannot fix the problem, tell us where we need to move it. The assembly line is moving. There is no time to go outside of the protocols. And if you go outside of protocols, you will be punished. And I understand that some of us may make this decision. I'm not trying to go back. I think that improving this would be to communicate and discuss how we should more effectively address the problem. What is it? Why they hurt? What we can do about it? So then many times we don't need to surgery. And the second part is that many of those people have demand. They want to help. Doctor, what do you mean? The toughest answer me as a surgeon is, I don't know what, why you hurt. I cannot help you. That breaks my heart, but it happens too. And that's why I kind of sarcastically says, who would fix your bone if, because I, as a surgeon, whether I believe biomechanics or not, the ugly truth is I have to set the bone or help you because that's my job. And that no, I cannot say go somewhere else. And many times I, I will tell you this, last thing, let's say with kids, sometimes I look at x-ray and say, nothing needs to be done. I, it will heal. And sometimes I say, I don't like this fracture. I need to operate it based on my training experience and hours and hours of training. And that's the decision. But I am, if I am wrong, I have to, I will be held accountable and I am not making any bones that one of the decision is whether I am doing something which is not supported by my, my tribe. And you are absolutely right. It is all about apprenticeships. And there are few people that are in Ivy Towers and they train a lot of people 
And those are our opinion leaders. And if you are in trouble, you pray that those people will come to the court and say, yes, Dr. Talak did standard of care. Because mm -hmm. you will lose your livelihood and everything. So I just want you a little bit, maybe open this, that it is not a science. It is just pure survival. Thank you. Hey, um, we have another Robert who's got a uh, question or comment. You want to? It's Bob, though, right? <laughs> yeah, Bob, but Robert's fine. Yeah, I, I do have a different. Um, I do have a comment. Um, I, I totally appreciate Dr. Talek's situation. You know that he's in, and we all need to practice the best way we can in the situations. That, that we are. Um, my reality is completely different. I mean, I am a, I am a physical therapist. I do all manual therapy. I am a one man company. I spend an hour with each patient. And so I do have the time to go through. So when someone comes in and says that, that their back hurts, I, I can evaluate the whole body. I can, I can evaluate whether the spine is moving, whether the pelvis is aligned, whether the ankle is moving, whether it's fascial, whether it's visceral, whether, I mean, there's lots of different aspects of what it could be. But we talked before about cognitive dissonance and, and things. It's like, I, I can tell you when patients come in and they wanna know what's wrong and they've seen their physicians or they've seen different practitioners and they don't understand why the issue. And, and when you do the full body evaluation, and you explain to them what you see and why you think they're having the problems. I can't tell you the number of times when I've heard patients say, "Is like, well, that's the first thing that's made sense to me because you've, you've looked at the way the whole body is integrated. You've looked the way you've looked at all the tissue layers and how they're they're involved. So that's my reality, and it, it's it's totally different. But I, I think that you know patients, when you do have the ability to explain to them what you think is going on, I think patients really appreciate it because they for the first time I think they get an understanding. Of, of why they hurt and there's things that they can do about it. Yeah. And then you charge them $15 for it, right? I charge them a little more than $15, yes. So that's my reality. I know. I, I charge I, I for that what I do. That's what the government tells me that people 65 year and older, my time is worth $17.60. So my hospital says we cannot really tell fellow government that to go and uh, not send us these patients, you have to make it. So you get five minutes and I see 20 of those people. So that's a reality. Again, I'm just saying sure. this is not anything magical. This is simple money and time. And if you are in charge of your time, you are blessed. If you, you can be on top of the pyramid in actually, believe or not, the situation is changing uh, because we have ever increasing uh, Medicare population that hospitals are now telling that we will work only three weeks uh, from the month. One week we have to take uh, off, but I still have to be responsible for the patients. So I get call from home like I am now home because they don't want to pay my time, but nurses are taking care of these patients and they don't know what to do. So they call and say, doctor, we have this lady. She fell. We don't know what should be done. So you, you understand the medicine is getting to be split between those who are moved to assembly line and those who can go to you, for example, and spend an hour or two. And I understand this is perfect and it should be like that. But then if you, it, it is more complicated. I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm just saying that it's not that easy and there is not cognitive dissonance. It's just simply dollars. If I would tell you that you would have to charge only $17 for your patients, then you would have to make tough decision. Either you will shorten your time or you will go out of business because I guarantee you, you cannot pay your bills and all this stuff for this small amount of reimbursement. And that's a reality of United States with nobody says. In the UK, Europe, I practice, they don't have these problems. They don't care. They hospitals are, but they have different challenges. So I am just saying that science and medical is one part. 
a lot of what we are seeing is dictated by reality of patients and how the practitioners, how the system is set up. And unfortunately, we cannot, we do not have unlimited resources. So we, yeah. we, can we, can we, uh, Carol may, Carol, you're ready to chime in on this too, right? Well, just very briefly, uh, one of the greatest pleasures of my life was to work at a medical center where physicians would send their patients to me before surgery. And I would be able to do um, the relief of pain because I understood fascia and I understood fascial restrictions and I understood pain mechanisms and I understood the neurology as well as the orthopedics um, or the musculoskeletal aspects of pain and the whole body aspect of pain. So Dr. Talley, I want to encourage you to think about two things today with all due respect and very humbly I offer this simply as person to person, not uh, physical therapist to physician. Um, I want to offer you two ideas. Ex you're, you're already getting into very dangerous territory now because if the tribe knew that you were hanging out with us, there would be some pressure. You're interested in another model, obviously, and your interest is scary. It seems to me, this is my idea or uh, impression from what you said, not just what you said, but how you said it. It's very scary because you're walking in very dangerous territory, but there is a way in which um, I find that you and others like you, people that are even friends of mine, are caught in what Andrew Weil has said to us is the, is the downfall of the American medical system it's like the Titanic and it's, it's more than one half submerged and people like you and uh, are running around the deck trying to keep the deck chairs even so that the tribe says that everything looks good and people, it seems to me, are being used as objects uh, to end, an end to the means of capitalistic gain. And after a while, the, the cognitive dissonance of that, the, the unhappiness of that, I, don't, I see it also in politics. People are not sleeping well, and we only have one life to live. And so without being any more moralistic than that, I will simply say welcome to a different tribe. We hope that you'll keep open. We'll always be willing to listen to your, your particular take on this. But remember, there are people out there who are willing to see your patients, whether the tribe says it's okay or not, and allow them to have an alternative to the knife, which is we think really the future. And we will rise up based on human patient request and need while the Titanic continues to sink. Um, and I hope I haven't offended anybody by my- You did not offend me at all. I 100% agree. I just, I would love to share my patience. I just believe that system as is such is gonna split. And I have only, I, I look like I run around, but I have only two options. I could adopt your model. And that means that hundreds of patients would not, like I used, now I am privileged. I'm in Houston. I used to practice in Tennessee. The doctors with my credential the next one was 600 miles. I had 600,000 people in 18 counties to take care of. So that I am you not- You only have one life to live, is what all I'm I saying. Understand, you only understand. have one life to live. I know, I know. I, uh, I, am, I, will tell, I will make one more comment that you will think my craziness. I haven't been on vacation 10 years. That's the US medicine. What is it? Well, but you know, I would say that you see, look, sometimes people in the U.S., you know, especially from the inside, when they see, they, they see how crazy or how assembly line it is from the inside, and say, you know, oh, Europe is not the, is not is not the same. But uh, look, I just gave you the numbers from the NHS, which is a kind of praise the British system, which is well, maybe instead of the four minutes, they give you six minutes, right? So, and if you go to France, you might get eight. You know, and somewhere else you might get 10. 
but that's more or less, you know, like which 10 compared to your four is a lot of time, right? But, uh, you know, you would, you know, you would be able to at least say hello properly and so on, but uh, still, you know, being under this kind of pressure of seeing whatever 30, 40, 50 people a day and, you know, like really in, without the opportunity to reset yourself or, you know, because every person is an individual experience and there are certain, you know, timings for different thoughts and ideas that come. And by the time they have to percolate, you have to be doing another person, right? So you see just, this is, uh, yeah. I am with you. I, so, but we can talk anyway, about I'm still, I'm still, I'm, some so, other time. I, I, I'm I just want to say that I'm very grateful that you are really sharing it. And that, you know, as uh, Carol just said, right? So you see, like, usually uh, it's not very well uh, looked upon from your tribe. So you see that this is your kind of hanging out with the wrong people, you know, like, which no, uh, I, I love, I have been watching it. I, I love it. I just want to share that there may be something that it's not meeting uh i that's all thank you very much so susan up to you you know you are in charge further right oh, you are muted uh lydia mayor is here and uh she put something in the chat because she's unable to um you know to jump in on the video um, interesting, we are talking about paradigms of care. We haven't yet gotten to the role of science and healthcare's deliver healthcare delivery's relationship with that, or the dialogue between experiential and quantified knowledge. So um, that's just a comment from the chat. This has been unexpectedly more amazing than I could have imagined, right? Absolutely. I mean, I knew it was going to be great because I had seen the video, but I didn't know the conversation was going to go to all these amazing places that are so important. Who else is but, talking about this? Yeah, let me just get one one point, right? Is that because yeah. as I was re-listening re to it, right? So you see again, that's true that every time you listen, you kind of get this extra clicks. So for example, the conversation about depression and loads, that's absolutely true. You know, like certain things is that as you listen, it just kind of clicks on your, on your points and say, well, somehow I didn't put enough highlight on this, that yes, indeed, you know, whether it's, you know, when you go and measure the, pressure in the tire right so it's supposed to be two atmospheres whether yes. it's a you know whether it's a truck or whether it's a, you know whether it's a mini or whether it's whatever whether it's a cadillac right so whilst the load that they exhibit on the that they ex exert on their on the ground would be completely different so, so that's so a very I have, I have heard steve talk about this for years right just today hearing it I thought of the idea that you cannot add air to the tire by putting weight on top of the car. Right. That's what it is. That's a, just a different way to say it. You cannot add air to the tire by putting weight on top of the car. You can't add pressure to the tire. Well, I'm saying uh, the uh, Dr. Nakinson, not Nakinson got a several awards for that. Yes, it is all wrong. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I would, I would not dare to say this in front of the orthopedic meeting. Otherwise, unless would, I would wear the bulletproof wall uh, vest. <laughs> and also, <laughs> and also the times. hockey helmet, right? So you see the hel the, no, <laughs> the Greek helmet with the nose protection, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I've been I shot at many times because I've said it. Yeah, there are more. There's more than a couple of us here that have been shot at, but we're yeah. we sleep well. I understand. I understand. <laughs> you my. know, I will uh, maybe Dr. Graham is here. I'm right next to my. That's a big privilege because I was the other day reading his book on biotensegrity in a surgeon lounge, and people thought that I am crazy. And of course, one of my nurses went and she said, <laughs> "You know, that's a Dr. Talek. 
he reads about this biotensegrity. He has PhD in biophysics. He just don't watch anything else. Just read this crazy stuff. And when I when I want to really provoke them, I would ask if your muscle contract, how is it possible that we stay erect? And of course, that's a like talking blasphemy to Doctor uh, Doctor Talik. I'm going to challenge you to build a tensegrity and leave it in the lounge for them. <laughs> I do. I, I have actually, uh, there is a whole lot, lot of topic. I, I truly believe like a disc, we are, we have it all wrong. It's not cushioning pressure. It, I am big proponent of Serge Grazovesky. I read every book he has and stuff. I truly believe that that's how the engine works. But or for example, knees, uh, the, the study that Dr. Levin did that the surfaces never touch. I have done that in my practice. I have done dozens of patients that we inject ligaments with a, like what the people call stem cells to make them stronger. And even the cartilage is a little bit damaged. The space opens up and symptoms disappear and people water ski every day. We avoid surgery. So I could talk more. I am a proponent of it. I'm not uh, trying to. Uh, I know that there is a better model. I'm just saying that there are realities. And I live a schizophrenic life. I go to work <laughs> to make money. And then I go to watch biotensegrity tea party to kind of intellectually stimulate myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's so things worked out very well but you see look there is more of the interesting things coming up in the series right so you see, as i said there would be you know eventually i think we will be running close to 20 episodes and uh, they are i believe they're gold and you know really that they, they each of them could be like as you dig in or as we dig in there there was more and more of those uh, this because this time we just touched the beginnings right so you see and you know i guess it's been more than two hours and i guess we have to start closing this somehow yeah. maybe maybe leonid you can do a closing toast yeah but just before you're doing the closing toast i just wanted to say one thing right is that you know what I found particularly important there in this in this entire journey, right, is that most of the people, you know, like by the time I met Steve, it was 2009, right? So you see, that's like 25 years, uh, no, 35 years after he started. So with the first getting the presentations and 50 plus years after he started and so on. So, and by that time, he already had a certain pitch elaborated, right? Certain kind of presentation that he was trying to squeeze in and so on. And that presentation, when it's squeezed and crystallized, it might have its strengths. It might have its kind of, you know, uh, alienating properties, right? And what I wanted there, I wanted to actually go more wait, to the wait, roots wait. to, I need to that see word. the soil. Uh, I need that word. It might have its what properties? Crystal properties. It got crystallized, right? Okay. So whilst, you know, like what we want is to put this crystal back into the soil and actually see how that thing grew out of the soil right so you see to to see what actually nourished it originally that was my greatest kind of drive in this so and that's what i want to highlight really right is that it's that it's uh, you know like this experiential and experiential versus their educational right this is a very important aspect and that out of the experiential the different types of growth that different type of the interpretations can actually be built upon and that's because for many people unfortunately right so you see is steve's bombastic style of presentation often sounded like a deterrent oh you know this this is this is this levin chap he's so close-minded he has you know fixed on his you know bad integrity idea kind of preaching and so on and when you listen to the to the origins, you understand that you know that crystal grew out of the most kind of humble and you know most humanly understandable things. Okay, these are my experiences and this, these are my experiences and this and this and that and that. And you know, because he also, you know, 
experienced biomechanics in the pre-crystallized phase, right? So which is very, very different, right? So you see, when you talk to the professors from the universities today, they have never seen the biomechanics in the pre-crystallized way. For them, it's a crystal, right? So you see, like if it's a, you know, let's say a 40, 50 year old, that means that he already learned it at school as a God's kind of, as a complete fixed block without any questioning and so on. So, and that's why Steve's experience is so valuable. Says, hey, you know what? I met, I, I actually saw that biomechanics in the very beginning when it was just one of the ideas. And, you know, like it wasn't gospel back then. And that is, I think, is a very, very valuable thing, particularly out of this kind of chapter one or the episode one of the whole series. So, and with this, let's probably, we are, our numbers are falling. So the last 20 who are standing. the toast, Leonid? I'll give you the toast. The toast is going to be very simple. So thank you very much for being there. And you see, as the conversation with Dr. Tag, you know, shows, there is a lot of emergent properties which are suddenly showing up in the most unexpected way and bring us, you know, lots of new and really exciting perspectives. And that whole series, you know, the next episodes, they developed exactly that way. We had a sort of rough narrative, but then the journey took us in the most unexpected ways. And I think that you're going to be as fascinated by this journey as I was when I took it, you know, with Steve. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers and thank you. Have a good year. Have a good year too.